Groucho, what was the story about um, it's when not you were? True. No, when you were on the when you were on the road. Yes. There's a story about a lady and a baby carriage or something that yes. you met, and, and no one would tell me the story, but they said to well, ask you about it. It's rather interesting. We used to pick up girls after each performance. No. You know, we'd roam the town like Muncie. This happened to be Muncie, Indiana, and there was a, a young girl around 20 years old. She was wheeling a baby carriage. Mm-hmm. And I stopped, and I said, that's a very pretty baby you got there. <laughs> she says, oh, uh, are you with the show here in town, the Baudible show? Because we dressed a little better mm-hmm. than the natives of Muncie, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> or even Cincinnati. I see. Well, maybe not Cincinnati. <laughs> At any rate, it was a very attractive little baby, and she didn't look bad either. A lovely pair of gams. Gams. Um, gams. That's an old-fashioned word for legs. Uh-huh. You know, I remember an actress once in Hollywood. She was kind of a pretty flashy dame. And she wore an, an-, an ankle around the here. A little bracelet? A little yeah. bracelet. And on it, it said, Heaven's Above. And I thought that was so wonderful. <laughs> Heaven's Above. That's true. And I have subscribed to that theory for years. <laughs> There's no humor and, like that anymore. Yeah. We left the well, lady Well, they should be, yes. Anyway, uh, she says, you're with the show. I'm going tonight, I said. I said, uh, where are you going now? She said, oh, I'm taking the baby for a walk. I said, are you the mother? She says, yes. Mm-hmm. She was lying, like most women. <laughs> and she lived in a, a one-story house. It's kind of an old-fashioned Midwestern shack. And uh, she invited me upstairs, and I went upstairs. I was smoking a big cigar. And she put the baby to sleep, and then I was sitting on the couch with her. And I was doing fairly well, considering I was smoking while I was kissing her. (laughs) And uh, what I didn't know is that her husband was a coal miner. And he wore one of those hats with a lamp in the front. (laughs) Like they used to in those towns. These were all coal towns. And... uh, she wasn't too hot either by this time. Uh, at any rate, I was sitting with her, and nothing, you know, just my arm around her and kissing her mm-hmm. and smoking. It was lovely sitting there. <laughs> the baby was asleep, and suddenly I hear the f- footsteps coming up to the first floor. And she says, my husband, you told me this was your sister's baby. She says, it isn't. It's my husband's baby. I says, well, what will I do? She says, well, run in the closet there. There was a closet right there. I ran in the closet, and there were about raincoats in there and heavy coats and ulsters and all kinds of miscellaneous clothing. And uh, in my excitement, I had left a cigar on the couch where I'd been making love to this girl. The cigar was right in plain sight? Yes, it was right there on the couch. So uh, he comes in, and he smells cigar smoke. He says, you got somebody in here? She says, well, you know I wouldn't do that. You know I'm a happily married woman. So he said, I'm going to search this place, and if there's anybody here, I'll kill him. (laughs) This is not the ideal way to make love. (laughs) Now he starts. He first goes in the kitchen, Uh and I grabbed the cigar, and I took that with me in the closet. (laughs) Now he comes back, and he says, there was a cigar there a minute ago. (laughs) Where is it? There's somebody in this place, and I'll kill him if I can find him. He opens the closet door there, and he feels... I don't know. You better feel him. (laughs) And he felt me, you know, all over. I could feel his hands on me, but he couldn't see me. It was dark in the closet there. I was shivering like this. So he finally goes back in the kitchen. I'm going to find that guy. It was the last thing I do. And I jumped out of the first-story window and got back to the theater. So, uh, well, that's all there was to it, but I could have been killed by a coal miner in Muncie, Indiana. (laughs) And that isn't the way I wanted to end my life. No, you, Because a... I had notions that I was going to succeed in show business eventually, mm-hmm. and then I wouldn't be killed by a coal miner. What went through your mind when the guy's hands were... Well, yeah. it's pretty hard to say. It's about 45 years ago. Yeah, but, must have uh, been terrified. Oh, I was terrified. Yeah. Uh, Holly, they had a tough time getting me to go on the stage that evening, the other boys. I told them about this experience, but they... Uh, did that they were teach proud you? of me that I they escaped. Were. Did that teach you to be more prudent? No, I wouldn't say so. I think it made me more daring. 
Had I been killed that afternoon, yes. I would have been more prudent. <laughs> What about that problem? Oh, this was all actors had this problem on the road. We had no girls except sure. a few in the act. By this time, we were familiar with the girls in the act. Mm -hmm. We didn't pay any more attention You'd to them. You'd run out of conversation. We were looking for fresh stuff in these towns. <laughs> and uh, there was an old saying that when the actors come to town, hide the daughters. Especially Which, I mean, in Muncie, Indiana. No, in all towns. This was true. Actors yeah. had no standing at all during those days. It's not like it is today. An actor's a big wheel. He can go in any place. But in those days, you couldn't. I must tell you a story about Goody Ace. You got time for sure. this? Goody Ace, I don't know if you know who he is. He writes for a very prominent magazine. What's the name of it? Saturday Literary Review. Digest or something. He writes for the Saturday Review, I think. And he, Saturday Review. He used to write for Milton Berle. That's right. And he also wrote, he wrote for a lot of people. And many Easy others. Aces. Yeah. He was a brilliant guy. At any rate, we had lunch one day on Madison Avenue. And there was about 20 people standing in line for lunch. And Goody says to me, tell the proprietor who you are and we can get in right away. I said, well, I can't do that. These other people are standing in line. I'm going to stand in line with them. So the head waiter came out and he recognized me. I was doing the quiz show then. He says, Groucho, what are you doing standing in line? He says, I'm waiting to go and have lunch. So he says, come on in. I have a table for you and uh, that uh, fellow you were there, whoever he is. He had no idea who he was. Mm -hmm. So we went inside, and I was sitting down, and Goody Ace was grousing. I don't know how well you know him. He said, I don't understand this. I've written for every prominent magazine. I lecture at colleges. I've had my own shows and Broadway plays and everything. And here oh. you come along, and you get a table immediately. I says, Goody, don't you understand it? You have talent. There's no doubt about it. But actually, you're an nonentity. You couldn't get in any place without me. And it spoiled his whole lunch, and he never got over that. I think it would. Well, uh, it's terrible to find out actually that you're an he was a non entity. Yeah. And I kept insisting him on this. <laughs> but we're very close friends. Even he, in he spite of that kind of treatment, you're close friends. Yes, you're very rough on your friends, but they come back for more and they find you funnier and funnier. Well, I question that, but. Uh, well, that's what they say. Harry Ruby, you insult him mercilessly and... Yes, I do, but he requires it. <laughs> we have to pause. We'll be right back. <laughs>